This is Nick. This is Jack. Welcome back. It is Monday, April 8th, and today's pod is the best one yet. Best pod we've ever done. The top three pop business news stories you need to know today. Jack, I'm sorry. One second. One second. I'm wandering around. I can't. Can you see me? Can you see me? There's no sun up there. I think what my co-host Nick is referring to is the total solar eclipse, which is happening today. Yeah, you're in the path of totality right now. It's like messing with the podcast equipment. What's going on? Dude, I'm recording from home because the whole state has shut down for this event. I'm shocked you didn't Airbnb out your living room for this thing. Could have made millions. It's the biggest thing to happen to Vermont since fish food ice cream. The biggest thing to happen to the sun, I guess, since the last eclipse. Jack, three <laughs> stories for today's show. What do we got, man? It's a T-boy. For our first story, Bluey. Bluey isn't just a TV show for kids. Bluey is a $2 billion business for adults. So Jack and I are looking at why kids, parents, and investors are obsessed with Bluey. For our second story, it's Sweetgreen. Sweetgreen, the salad stock, has doubled in three months, and it's all thanks to one thing. Robo broccoli. And our third and final story is Grinder. Grinder, the LGBTQ dating app, is becoming an LGBTQ super app. Because dating apps need a long-term relationship with a business model. But Yetis, before we hit that wonderful mix of stories on this Eclipse Day. Wonderful mix of stories. Love the mix, Jack. Remember on Friday I told you I couldn't get any sunglasses for the Eclipse because they were all sold out? So I got a monocle instead? Look at this thing. Oh! I told you, I looked like the planter's peanut. I'm telling you, you need two of those. You got two eyeballs. <laughs> I got two of them. I got two of them. I just share one with Alex. In the meantime, while Jack's getting prepped for the eclipse, so many businesses are cashing in on the eclipse right now. Free eclipse donuts, free eclipse burritos, free sun chips with a total eclipse of the sun. Yeah, basically, if your business sells a circular product, you've dropped an eclipse version and your social media team is promoting it. But one business is cashing in on this eclipse the most. Literally. Because Nick and I found the one company that makes a majority of all the Eclipse sunglasses. The ones you can look at the sun without going blind. Get this, Yetis. American Paper Optics Company is a small family-owned business located in lovely Bartlett, Tennessee. Just outside Memphis. And American Paper Optics Company happens to have sold 75 million Eclipse sunglasses for today's Eclipse. 75 million is double the last Eclipse sunglass sales from 2017. And it's the most pairs of sunglasses any sunglasses company has ever sold in a single year. Can we say that, Nick? Well, you can say that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you just said that. <laughs> now, reminder, Yetis, PSA here. You should be wearing special glasses if you want to look up at the sun today. But the fascinating thing is that the odds are these sunglasses were probably made by this one tiny Tennessee company. It's really interesting. This company typically makes 3D glasses for movie theaters. But apparently they pivot the business every time an eclipse comes to town, Jack. They pause all their machines and they put in these crazy thick, like tinted pieces of plastic in there. Well, this company has sold 100,000 of those sunglasses to Ohio State University. Coca-Cola bought 100,000 of them too. Because these 75 million special eclipse glasses include a powerful optical technology. The lens is a thousand times darker than your typical pair of sunglass shades. Oh, Jack, these ain't no Ray-Bans. Forget about the Folkleys, man. So Yetis, enjoy today's eclipse. Besties, if you're in the path of totality, cherish it. And keep those Eclipse sunglasses on. And remember, you can't just layer two pairs of sunglasses on top of each other. You'd need a thousand. And don't forget that the company that made those glasses typically makes 3D goggles. It's the ultimate pivot. From a tiny town just outside Memphis. Nick, I look like the incognito logo with these monocles. <laughs> Jack, let's hit our three stories. 15 years before this song, two boys from the Northeast met in the dorm. They had an idea to cause a cultural storm. It's the best one yet, but the best is the norm. Jack, Nick, that's yeah. I don't even think they need to practice 50% that's a fat tip T-Boy City on your at list If you know you know cause we ready to go We can't wait no more so just start the show Start the show for our first story, Bluey, the kids' cartoon show about a family of blue healer dogs has become a, get this, $2 billion a year business. You won't believe the numbers behind Bluey. Now, Yetis, Jack and I spent the weekend reading the physical Bloomberg Business Week magazine. It's really nice to sit down on the weekend with some print media. You just curl up a little coffee. I can picture you now, Jack. Jack puts both of his hands around the mug, don't you? No blue light hitting these eyes. 
No screen toxicity, just paper cuts. But funny thing about that Bloomberg Business Week physical magazine, Yetis, the cover wasn't about interest rates, GDP, or the NASDAQ, was it, Jack? It was about Bluey, the kid's cartoon show that's become Nickelodeon's nemesis. Bluey, the anthropomorphic Australian cattle dog family created by Australian Joe Brum. This is a show about the healer family, which is a father and daughter named Bluey, who are blue healers, and a mother and daughter named Bandit, who are red healers. It's Baby Shark meets Sesame Street. On four legs. But this show appeals to both children and children's parents. It's the only kids show I'm aware of that families enjoy watching together because there are deep, like, moral undertones. And here's an example. There's an episode called Sleepy Time in which the mom dog is helping little Bandit get ready for bed, but Bandit can't sleep. And then what happens in Bandit's dream, Jack? When Bandit finally drifts off, she dreams that her mother is her son. So like the kid is watching and sees like a sleep story. I think it's like an innocent sleep story about going to sleep. But the mom is watching and sees a relatable metaphor about the struggle of parenting that you are the center of your child's universe. This is like an existential under theme and subplot about what it's like to be a parent. We're talking about the, like the Confucius of cartoons, Jack. I've only watched two episodes, both seven minutes long, by the way. And in both of those episodes, I finished the episode teary-eyed. They're so good. Yeah, these parents regularly finish these episodes crying and calling their therapist while the kids are rolling on the ground laughing. It's wild how both parties get a different experience from it. And that passion from parents is why Bluey has 2 million visitors on its Reddit page. There's something called Bluey's parenting philosophy that parents chat about. Oh, and if you go on Pinterest and search for Bluey, you'll see pictures of adults who got Bluey puppy tattoos on their legs. But the happiest Bluey stakeholder isn't kids or parents or the tattoos. It's the Bluey investors. Get this, besties. Bluey has become a $2 billion with a B business. That's right. $2 billion. They sell $2 billion a year in TV rights and merchandise. Oh, and it's not just the most watched kid show of all time right now, is it, Jack? It's the second most watched thing on TV overall last year. Behind Suits, 731 million hours of Bluey was streamed last year. Jack, could you sprinkle on some TV context for us over there? It's more than NCIS, more than Grey's Anatomy, Gilmore Gorse, or Friends. And it all goes back to 2019, when Nickelodeon, interestingly, passed on buying the rights to this Australian TV show. Because they already had Blue's Clues, which would have been confusing, not just because of the name Blue, but because Blue is a dog in Blue's Clues. Well, perfect timing because Disney was launching Disney Plus and Disney decided to buy the international rights for Bluey from BBC and the Australian Broadcasting Corp. And today, Bluey is like the most watched thing on Disney Plus. Get this, Bluey is 29% of all non-movie streaming on Disney Plus. Oh, and fun fact, Bluey is the first thing Disney's ever published. That includes the word poop. Apparently it was really controversial, but Disney did not want to say the word poop, but Bluey made them do it. Everyone poops, except Disney, apparently. Add it all up, Yetis and Bluey has sold $2 billion in TV rights, plush toys, and live events just in the last year. Holy keepy uppy. So, Jack, what's the takeaway for our buddies over at Bluey? The most valuable content on television is for toddlers. Now, Yetis, Jack and I have said that live sports are the holy grail of streaming. But Jack, what's the streaming industry more excited about, really? Kid shows. For example, Netflix snagged the rights to Coco Melon in 2020, the biggest English language YouTube show on Earth. That same year, HBO Max snagged the rights to Sesame Street, bringing Big Bird to streaming. And Bluey, it's only three seasons long, that's it. And yet it's the number one most streamed thing on Disney. Because toddlers and kids' content is crucial for busy families. And streamers want those busy families as subscribers. So season one of Bluey, that basically is your kid's on-demand digital babysitter. And that's pretty cheap. It can be. And the parents can watch too. So everyone, they think that streaming is an industry is focused on live sports or getting the Super Bowl. But the most valuable content on TV, it's actually the content for toddlers. For our second story, Sweet Green is the freshest stock on Wall Street so far in 2024 because the stock has more than doubled. Not because it opened a robo salad restaurant, but because it opened two of them. 
Sweetgreen is the only publicly traded stock that references hearts of palm and spicy sunflower seeds in the earnings calls. This company is so organic. Sweetgreen, the $3 billion Washington, D.C. founded salad company that is super popular among busy urban professionals. You're probably bullish on their beats. Yeah, we get it. But Sweetgreen has never been popular among investors until this year. Sweet green stock is up a whopping 130% in 2024. Hold the curry <laughs> cauliflower. Now, their latest earnings report did beat expectations for the first time since they IPO. But it wasn't because Sweet Green sold more kale, more arugula, or more profitable pickered peppers that Peter Piker picked. <laughs> the reason for the earnings beat is the Infinite Kitchen, Sweetgreen's fully robotic salad store. Now, Nick and I interviewed the co-founder of Sweetgreen, Nathaniel Rue, last year, just after they opened their first Infinite Kitchen in May. Yeah, so yeah, if you're curious about Sweetgreen, check out that interview. It's from last year. It's it's fantastic. But now, almost one year later, we have an update on how that Infinite Robo Kitchen is going. But here's the funny thing, Yetis. We don't know if the Infinite Kitchen salad tastes better. We haven't tried it. But we know its financials do. Oh, the financials taste way better, Jack. Because Yetis, as former sweet green junkies, Nick and I used to go there every day when we lived in New York. Not even former. I still got, I got it two days ago. If you're ordering food at a typical sweet green, you talk to a human behind the counter telling them what kind of salad you want. Pro tip, mix the pot sauce with the pesto. There you go. Now, there's a human preparing that salad that Nick just ordered, and that human can be inconsistent. For example, they might put a lot the hot sauce when you only ask for a little. Or they may forget the pesto when they needed the pesto to pair with the hot sauce. Now, Sweetgreen just reported that the Infinite Kitchen is much more consistent than human salad prepares. And it's quicker to prepare a salad with that robo thing than from a human. Yetis, this robo restaurant from Sweetgreen includes a series of tubes that drop the exact amount of spinach, broccoli, falafel, and pesto into your bowl. Exact amount. So customers like the consistency and the speed. But more importantly, the finance team likes it too. Frank from finance is like, um, spicy cashew, exactly two and a half ounces? Uh, scale this thing. The finance team likes the Infinite Kitchen because it lowers the cost of the restaurant. It's a $500,000 upfront investment, which is a lot, but lower labor improves the profit margin by a whopping seven percentage points. Oh, and get this. The Infinite Kitchen results in 10% higher revenue per order. Because since people are ordering on a tablet instead of orally, apparently you end up spending more money, Jack, on that salad. Because when you order on a tablet, you see all the upgrade options on the screen. So like you might tap the avocado, which is two bucks more, when you wouldn't have if you were just talking to somebody behind the counter. Yeah, Jack, it's like if we're talking to someone behind the counter, we're like feeling guilty, like we're getting judged for adding the avocado. But like with the screen, you're like, yeah, I'll double the avocado. So let's wrap this up. The Infinite Kitchen raises the roof with higher revenue per order and it lowers the cost because it's a robot resulting in seven percentage points higher profit per restaurant. But Yetis, all of that is not why sweet green stock has doubled so far this year, is it, Jack? No, it's not, Nick. So, Jack, lather me in pesto and tell us what's the takeaway for our buddies over at Sweet Green. Launching one is provocative. Launching two is proof. Yeti, yeah, the way Jack and I see it, the biggest moment for Sweet Green's business wasn't opening the first infinite kitchen. It was opening the second Infinite Kitchen. In December, Sweetgreen opened the second Infinite Kitchen location in Huntington Beach, California. Why was that such a big deal? Well, because it confirmed that the first location actually worked. Six months of Infinite Kitchen in Illinois, it must have been so good they had to launch a second. Now, Jack and I have seen flashy headlines of brands trying out robots here, trying out robots there, but honestly... They haven't worked. Chipotle launched Chippy a couple of years ago, an automated tortilla chip robot, but they shut it down in less than two years. Amazon launched Just Walk Out technology, but now they're removing it from their grocery stores. Sweetgreen's second Infinite Kitchen was an inflection point. Nick, they have 10 more of them planned to build out this year. Because, Jack, this second location, it really was proof that Sweetgreen has transformed into a lean, mean, robo-salad, profitable pickle machine. Because launching one is provocative. Launching two is proof. For our third and final story to kick off the week, Grindr just hired executives to expand the app from dating to travel and health. Grindr wants to become the LGBTQ super app because dating is limiting.
Yeti's Grinder. It's the first gay app to list on the New York Stock Exchange, and they celebrated with the first drag show on the New York Stock Exchange back in November 2022. A $2 billion company, it's the most diverse thing Wall Street finance has ever done. Grinder, it's a hookup and dating app for gay, bi, trans, and queer people. But the annual shareholder letter from Grinder stated ambitions that go way beyond the bedsheets. Interesting thing, Jack, and I noticed. Grinder says that they are embarking on ambitious multi-year efforts to broaden the functionality of our app. So what is this dating app launching? Not friending, not networking. They're launching travel and health services. In fact, Grindr just hired the founders of a fitness app to expand the app's functionality. But Jack, before we go on, I got to pause the pod for a second here. Trivia, which came first, Tinder or Grindr? It was actually Grindr. Grinder was the first dating app created back in 2009, a full three years before Tinder. And why was Grinder the first to launch a dating app, Jack? Because the gay community needed a safe space to connect. Straight people can confidently go to bars, restaurants, churches. They can find other straight people without being concerned in the same way that the gay community can. It's more challenging for the gay community, so they went to Grinder, which became the trusted safe space for connections. And here's the interesting thing about Grinder. They invested in that trust. They doubled down in it because they knew it was critical for their user base. Last year, they seized the opportunity to help their users by helping them order 235,000 free HIV self-test kits. Well, with this new inflection point, besties, in the future, Grindr could connect its 13 million users globally with the right healthcare specialist. Like ZocDoc for gays. Or Grindr could help those 13 million users find travel by curating queer-friendly travel destinations that are safe for their community. Like Hotwire for hotties. So Jack, what's the takeaway for our buddies over at Grindr? Dating apps need a long-term relationship to a new business model. Dating apps, they're like lonely right now. Like Match and Bumble, their stocks are both down over 80% from their record highs. Apparently charging users for super swipes only gets you so far. So Bumble is trying something different. Bumble is trying to be the super app for female relationships. Bumble has separate apps for dating, for friendships, and for business networking. While Match is also trying something different. They're doing a $500 a month super expensive matchmaking service. Now Grindr's trying something different too, expanding from their core dating service to healthcare and travel as well. Because dating apps need a long-term relationship to a new business model. Jack, you're looking fantastic. And can you whip up the takeaways for us over there? Bluey has become a $2 billion TV franchise, uniquely popular with both kids and their parents. Because the most valuable content on TV is for toddlers. Our second story was Sweet Green. Their infinite kitchen appears to be a game changer when it comes to profitability. Because launching one robo restaurant was provocative, but launching two was proof. And our third and final story is Grinder. The OG gay dating app is hiring to expand into travel and healthcare. Because dating apps, they need a long-term relationship with a new business model. But Yetis, this pod's not over yet. Here's what else you need to know today. First, the March jobs report just came in like a lion and went out like a lion. This economy added 303,000 new jobs last month, and the unemployment rate fell to 3.8%. 303,000 new jobs. That's enough new jobs to feel good about, but not so many to add to inflation. And second, stock of Ulta Beauty, the cosmetics chain, dropped 15% last week, dragging down Estee Lauder and Elf Cosmetics too. Ulta warned that the lipstick-led makeup surge since the pandemic has slowed down. Oh, and also, Sephora is getting aggressive. Get this, their strategy is to open up locations really close to Ulta. Now, apparently, a price war in cosmetics is coming to aisle six. And finally, Richard Branson's Virgin Cruise Line just launched a month-long cruise specifically targeting remote workers. You now take that Monday morning meeting with Marco off the starboard bow. Four straight weeks of being on a cruise ship, and apparently you work like nine to five? That is not a cruise I want to be on. <laughs> <laughs> Now, time for the best fact yet. Yeah, this one sent in by Yeti Roberto Mendoza from Mexico. DJ Burns is the biggest player on the NC State men's basketball team. But this six foot nine man also has a side hustle that we've covered on this pod. Burns owns two vending machines as a college student. That's right. DJ Burns Jr. bought two vending machines and runs them as side hustles. Apparently his buddy at Auburn taught him the importance of making money outside of basketball, as Warren Buffett puts it, making money while you sleep. 
Yetis, you look fantastic today. Jack, are you looking up right now? Are you seeing, what are you seeing, Jack? <laughs> Tell us what you're seeing. 3.33 p.m. Eastern time is when totality occurs. Uh, are you getting your monocle ready? You're kind of like the Monopoly guy with that thing. I'm praying for a clear skies, man. Yetis, if you haven't yet, click to follow us so you get this podcast every day. Honestly, it's a fantastic way to help grow the show. And if you miss the eclipse, just catch it in 100 years. Or just close your eyes. It's the same thing. Jack and I, will see you tomorrow. <laughs> it's not the same thing. <laughs> And before we go, a happy birthday to Yeti Cliff Averill. The Super Bowl champ turned real estate developer is celebrating his birthday over in London with the whole family. And happy birthday to Patrick Cagle, who's turning the big 4-0 in Pike Road, Alabama. And Pansy, the pot cake rescued dog, is turning seven years old in human years, or in dog years in St. <laughs> Lucia. Dog years or human years? Because dog years, it means he's just one. Then it's human years. And Keith <laughs> Tadlock is turning 48 years old, celebrating over in Burlington, Vermont, for the solar eclipse with the whole family. Keith, did you hear that the old Myers Bagels has a new cafe? You and I should grab a coffee there. Just don't do it at 3.30 p.m., Jack. And happy belated birthday to David Avital in Fairlawn, New Jersey. And Brian Urschel in Roan Park, California, forfeited his birthday to catch the eclipse. And congratulations to Duke No. From Boston, who's moving to San Francisco. Let us know if you need some restaurant recs, Duke. And Alejandro Del Valle from Tampa Bay, Florida, is celebrating a promotion. Alejandro is now higher up in the pecking order at Johnson & Johnson. Doctor approved. This is Jack. I own stock of Amazon, Bumble, Disney, and Netflix. And Nick and I both own stock of Airbnb and Chipotle.